Hi, I'm Charlie from 45 and it is my pleasure to be joined by Maya Hawke today. How are you doing, Maya? Good. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, congratulations on Moss. I've been listening to it all weekend and I can't stop singing it. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, it's a stunning record. So uh, looking at like all of the projects that you've been in, um, all of the stuff that you've got coming up, a Wes Anderson film, a film with Bradley Cooper, a fil- like some stuff with your dad, podcast, all of this stuff, Stranger Things, obviously. At what point in all of this stuff did you have time to record a full album? And was it a kind of a process that you compartmentalised compared to all the other stuff or was it quite fluid? Well, this this process was quite fluid. I think the next time I might compartmentalize more. <laughs> right. Um, this process was Benjamin Lazar Davis who produced the record. Um, and I had written, I think two or three songs together. And we had two or three days in a studio in LA in between the shooting of a movie that I was gonna do and shooting Stranger Things and this other movie. Um, and we were just gonna do it for two or three days, but then about a month, ahead of recording uh we I one of the movies I was doing fell through as happens and um so instead of having uh for two days we had kind of two weeks and so I called him and I was sort of like hey want to make a whole record like we have the time um and he was like yeah and then we got Christian Lee Hudson and my friend Will Grafe involved and then we kind of had a month of scattershot manic songwriting that I think it never would have happened if like you know sometimes you catch everyone in the right emotional place where they're just together enough to get something done and just vulnerable enough that they have the drive to want to do something um well I think that that is sort of what happened um with everyone and so then we kind of had two quick weeks in of recording this record after having written it sort of scattered shot of a couple days of rehearsal and then recording. And then I went back to Stranger Things um, right after. And then when Stranger Things wrapped and this film Do Revenge that's coming out um, in September wrapped, which I was shooting simultaneously, both in Atlanta. Um, when that both of those things finished, we went back into a studio in upstate New York and finished up the record, recorded two new songs and did final touches. Um, and so it, it, this record sort of happened very much like simultaneously and a, a part of other things. Um, and which is, I think it's like a super vulnerable record um, uh, cause it's not very like protected, I guess. Um, and uh, that is the meaning of vulnerable, unprotected, brilliant mind Maya. Um, and that's kind of, that's sort of the, how it happened. So what what's the songwriting process like for you? Are you a kind of voice memos on your phone type girl or is it is it all kind of you wait till you're in a songwriting headspace or while you were doing all this other stuff, are you jotting down lyrics and things like that? Definitely a jotting down lyrics, voice memos on the phone situation. And then the lyrics get kind of perfected and sometimes sent with an accompanied voice memo to a willing collaborator and then sort of emails go back and forth with different versions and edits and thoughts and uh until there's some kind of rough first draft of a song and then we went into the rehearsal space and kind of being in the same room together quote unquote perfected them and by perfected, I do not mean perfect. I mean, got them into a place where we wanted to record them. Um, I don't believe in the word perfect. Do you, I mean, that must be, if you don't believe in the word perfect, that must be quite a driver for you to do all this stuff. If you are always striving for uh, something better. Definitely always striving for something better. Um, but no, I just mean, I don't believe in the word perfect in it. Like perfect conveys in my brain images of like silicone and like (laughs) robots and um uh like manicures and I am much more interested in the messy but worth capturing makes sense um I heard you talk a little bit about this album having a kind of thread that was about 
losing this kind of false sense of self that you'd created um I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and where you think that came from and how this work allowed you to kind of move past it I think part of the reason why it the work uh, was had that quality to it was because it did happen with such urgency and kind of franticness um of just being like I guess we have the time to make a record so let's make one so there wasn't a lot of time to like figure out what parts I wanted to hide. Um, like it was just sort of like, oh, I guess we'll give it, here's, here goes it all. Um, even the things that I think are stupid or like not good enough or whatever. Um, and then, so there was that. And then I just kind of noticed this like, uh, because again, because it was made quickly to a certain degree, I, I had to kind of go back and source a lot of old material lyrically like Bloomed Into Blue is from a poem I wrote in high school. Um, uh, I think um, you know, there's, and there's other things in there that were like taken out of old diaries. Um, things, uh, Cell Bellary Drive was from a voice memo I made a year before. Um, the, the, there's a kind of a collection, it, it felt like part of a collection of data and historical points from throughout my life of creativity. Um, and I um, which also made it very reflective, like, oh, wow, I was thinking about this when I was 17 and I'm still thinking about this. Like in this line, I can draw connectivity there. And like, oh, this was something I thought was my biggest secret or whatever when I was 20 and that still feels like a big secret or or why do I, do I am I continually banging myself over the head with this desire to be this kind of person that I'm not quite um why not just let go and be that be, be who you are um so I think that, that it was kind of that that kind of making a personal history that also triggered that uh and then I think that I really found a way of working that was very, the people that I was working with, Christian, Will, and Ben, all really wanted me to be the most myself and like wanted the record to sound like me and wanted my opinions on things and, and taught me so much about producing and recording music and playing music. And um, I think that that was also very empowering um, uh, and having, having collaborators that want to move you forward, not sort of like hold you in your place so that they can fill up the space around you, you know? Um, and so I think that, that that those two things were a big part of why. And then that's why, I mean, like, I don't think the record itself, I, re I really listened to it recently and it's quite a sad record. Um, hmm. And so I don't think the record it, itself really has within it the like catharsis or exaltation of like, oh, now welcome in the joy, here it comes. Um, but for me personally, when the record was done, that's how I felt. It was like, okay, now that sadness is like, I can let that go and come into this new place. So I think the record is, is more of a, like a, a tomb or something uh, than it is this kind of break or exaltation, but the, the break came after. That's so cool. I think if I, I mean, it's like really cohesive as an album. If I was like mining my teenage diaries for stuff, like one, it would be so cringe. And two, I'd end up with this kind of like disparate mix of sounds, but it's really interesting that you say like a lot of the stuff kind of carries through and they were like the same themes. Yeah, I've noticed, I noticed that. I mean, it's like uh, bloomed into blue, over and mermaid bar um all have like and kind of luna moth all have this like death in them this mm -hmm. like kind of killing of an old self um or like near misses i don't know i just i noticed a lot of themes um yeah you mentioned uh luna moth there's a line in that that resonated that said i don't need you to hurt me i can do that myself um would you say that you are like your own kind of worst enemy in that regard like your own harsh, harshest critic I think I definitely am definitely very quite self self 
self-sabotaging um uh and 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 pretty self um ridiculing uh but i wouldn't and and i've had a a pretty nice life full of people who love me a lot and are really nice and kind so i think maybe yeah but i definitely think that the meaning of that line is is closer to like the feeling of being like i really like i i don't need anyone you know like there there are those there are kids who like got punished as kids and i when i was a kid i would like if i like broke one of my mom's lipsticks i would like lock myself in my room <laughs> and like sit and cry and be like i'm in a timeout i've been bad <laughs> and i think that that theme has gone on a little bit throughout my life and I, that song was about this feeling of being like i really don't need you to be mad at me i'm mad enough at myself like i really i am doing the work that needs to be done in terms of punishing me and put, and like you know i so i definitely think that i'm i'm definitely my my worst enemy it's um it's a really beautiful song i mean like it's there's so many things i want to dive into i i think we should talk about Therese I mean it was it's it's so catchy <laughs> for one um but when you learn about the meaning behind it um which it would be better coming from you but it's a, about this painting in the Met which drew controversy as a painting of a young girl um why did that painting resonate with you um so much it's so funny. I, I, a couple days ago, I was I, I really like David Sedaris and mm. I've been reading one of his new books. I think it's called Happy Go Lucky. Um, I like his audiobooks, And in it, he, ha he is his uh, a speech he gave at uh, like a college, a college speech. And in it, he was giving people kind of random advice. And he was like, find find one thing that you're really offended by rather than like <laughs> thousands of things. And if you notice that the thing that you're offended by is a, um, a painting at the Met where you can see somebody's underwear, remember that the goal is to have less in common with the Taliban, not more. Um, <laughs> which of course is him and is funny, but I was just sort of surprised to like hear him reference this painting that I'd also, and end this controversy. Um, but really I'd always, um, uh, it, to me, it's, it was less about the political controversy around the painting, but the I'd always loved the painting as a kid and had never even thought about the creator of the painting. I'd mm -hmm. only thought about the subject. Like, and I think that was, that's kind of a child's relationship to art. A mm -hmm. little bit is like, you watch the movie and you think those are real people. You don't think about the person who wrote the characters or you think like, oh, look at those real people. And the same was true for me in terms of visual art, where it, I wasn't thinking about oh, this is an impressionist painting. Oh, this is a what modernist. Oh, this is this. Um, I was just sort of like, look at that person. And as a young girl, that was a painting of a young girl where she wasn't like virginal and holding her white dress on a swing. She was like tough and kind of like had no regard for the way her clothing was falling and like was in this kind of masculine, positioning um and she felt modern and mm -hmm. cool to me and unselfconscious and and not vain and spoke to me um and then when the controversy happened i was like oh my god of course someone had to paint her like that's not just a person there was someone who made all these choices about the composition of this painting and people will have feelings about those choices and like that they may or may not have been good or safe choices for that person. Um, but I was also like, oh no, I love Therese. Like I love Therese Dream, like I love this painting person. And so kind of this sad discovery that like some man created this image, but then also this desire to be like, wait, but I wanna protect, I wanna protect her from having the, people think about her creator and not her um whether or not that's the right way to think about art i don't know but it was how i felt when i when i was thinking about all this stuff um it was like it the, the creator is of course important but i wanted to protect her too um from in her own existence that exists outside of her creator 
Um, and, uh, and I, so, so there's that, but then there's also so many other things in that song about just like relationships that I had as a young person and how, when we are, and this is, I think it's a similar theme of like when you're a kid and you are kind of first discovering yourself as an adult and just going through puberty and discovering your sexuality. And, um, and it often happens in this, at least for me, it happened in these kind of more safe spaces, like at slumber parties and like in, in beautiful friendships and like handholding and, um, and then puberty really hits you with a storm. And all of a sudden, rather than your sexuality being this kind of quiet secret you're discovering by yourself alone in your room and with your friends, it becomes this kind of projection on you of the world of like, oh, now you're sexual. Now you have to cover, now you have to wear a top when you go swimming. Now you have to, you know, protect yourself from the prying eyes of society that wants to sexualize you. And how sad that shift is. Um, and so, I, I guess the song is kind of about about all that all that stuff. I'm not being the most articulate right now. But. You you really are. But um, I think with the the video was really interesting to me because considering the kind of statement that you were trying to make um, about all the stuff that you just talked about, I think the response to the video in this kind of meta way almost backed up your points. I mean, there were the people that took the time to understand the statement that you were making but then there's also the kind of the side of the internet I suppose that is like stranger things duh with our top on and like there's that kind of that kind of commentary which I think just goes further to to yeah but backing up what you were saying but I suppose when creating the video how much did you consider the response and how much was that the intended response yeah, it's funny. I definitely like when I think about art and creativity, I definitely try not to think about them as statements or like as and try not to think about the response too much. It's like if if you're trying to get a response, like you're always going to lose because you just can't control the way that people feel or think. So and, and I don't I think that art can always be inherently political. But I think as used as a propaganda tool for any political agenda, it's that's a misuse. I think it's like it, you have to you have to make the art that you want to make. And if it influences, it impacts people. And, and if it backs up a political agenda in some way or another, fine, great. But if you're using it as a propaganda tool, it gets more complicated and is and and is less what how where my motivation comes from. Um, so I, I really just wanted to express that feeling of, of the interrupted process of a, of a pure discovery of free sexuality. Um, and like that something that is just beautiful and just good and just safe and people being kind to each other is demonized um, by society and, 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 and then it becomes bad and changes the way that you think about it. Um, and I definitely stayed off the internet for the mo in when it, after because I knew uh, in 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 terms of the way that I thought about the response I knew there would be one um I wasn't sure how big um or like but I I I caught a couple glimpses mostly of like if you I, I've noticed like on Instagram if you look at your like tagged stories Instagram seems to be a place that like maybe is more positive like than Twitter or Reddit or whatever or like the mm -hmm. internet like generally people only post about things if they like like them um on their public mm -hmm. public Instagrams um there and so I did and I got to see a couple of like young women especially like get like really get it um and just or just young people like really be like oh this is what this is about and it made me feel free and good and I was like great awesome um that's what I wanted um and I think you know we're so I've said this before but we're so consistently and I basically any kind of negative response I just call bullshit to like to the nudity or whatever because we're constantly bombarded with like airbrushed billboards and like and doctored images of people's bodies and like violent pornography and like you cannot avoid that in the world and if anyone thinks that like 
their kids are being protected or avoiding seeing that kind of image, they're wrong. Like um, you're, they're not. And what I, so I, what I think in any, like, is that what I would have wanted as a young person was like, you know, the curiosity is inherently going to be there and it's all over billboards on the highway when you drive down them. And I think that op options of things to look at that aren't violent, that are, that are like, beautiful that are not doctored where you can see people's like pimples and they're like you know pubic hair scars or whatever even but but they're so well lit and it's so beautiful and he, like and that's I, I I just think that's a positive thing it definitely is I saw that I think I saw in the credits that you had worked with your brother on the video is that right he is the boy in the opening image in the car Right. Okay. Makes sense. Um, I also saw you credit him in the liner notes of the record as, um, let me find the quote, as like making you love music again. Yeah. So talk to me about that. What, why well, is first of all, my brother's my best friend. He's an amazing actor. Um, he's shooting a movie right now and, uh, just did his first TV show. Um, and is just an incredible musician and actor in person. Like I'm about to do a, live show soon but the last time I played live was as his backup singer in his band in Providence um so we're best friends and during the pandemic we were pretty much alone together with our families um and we just started we played a lot of music together and he was in a big kick of practicing guitar and practicing songwriting and I'd really kind of shut down as a like songwriter um, because I'd met all these wonderful songwriters who were so much better than me at guitar and at songwriting. And I'd kind of been like, you know what? I think I can contribute as a lyricist, but I'm not, I'm not even gonna play that game. I'm not even gonna touch my guitar. I'm not even gonna like, I don't, I can't compete and I don't wanna try. And then I was sitting, when I was sat with my brother, he started getting me to play guitar again with him and to come up with melodies writing with him and um, not to kind of segment out my relationship to music so directly. And he knows me so well, but I also respect him so much. And he was, he was really able to like be encouraging in that way and to like make my ideas work really beautifully. And, uh, and it just like, I don't know, it freed me up and made me feel excited about, I think one thing that's difficult a great reason to go to college or drama school or conservatory or whatever is that it gives you time to practice your craft um, while no one's going to hear it really like to and to make mistakes and be bad and I think once you're in the public eye there's this desire to like be done because you don't want to do something and embarrass yourself like you don't want to get up and play guitar badly once you're already famous it's like this because then that's humiliating but like so it can kind of stunt your growth as a person. And I think that it just, that the, during the pandemic, it was a wonderful opportunity with my brother to kind of unstunt my growth a little bit because in the privacy of our own home and getting to make mistakes, and whatever, you know? That's beautiful. I've heard a lot of musicians talk about that time as like, you know, even to, to the extent of like, usually when you're making a record, you've got studio time booked and that's costing money and and like the this period giving them a kind of real freedom to experiment and try things in the way that you only can really like before your first first record so makes total sense um I think we're almost out of time but uh I just wanted to ask you know with so many things going on what does creating music give you that your other artistic pursuits don't and and what are your hopes for this record well as with anything whether it's a movie or a tv show or you just wanted to do well enough that you're allowed to make another one um <laughs> so my hopes for this record are that i get to make another one um is that like the world goes okay you can try again um that's my hope for the record. Um, and uh, my, uh, and what's different about it? I, it's all different. Every movie's different. Every record's different. Um, there is a wonderful social consistency to music in terms of the relationships you build and getting to go back to them to make more music in the future. 
versus the kind of world of making films and television where it's like, you're with these 15 people in this location for this period of time doing this thing. And then you all go off on your separate ways and do different things. With the music, like as long as everything goes well with you and those people, you can kind of keep coming back to them. And, um, and, those, and those relationships are really enduring and beautiful and kind of are a grounded through line of intimacy and friendship that kind of centers and grounds a kind of chaotic, otherwise chaotic life. Um, and so that's wonderful and kind of getting to take agency and control and be like, I wanna make this record now in this time, in this place, and, and getting to kind of be in control. Um, so a kind of grounded, centered intimacy in terms of relationships and a sense of control um, of your own kind of destiny and fate and when things happen and what, what's going to happen um, is really cool. Thank you so much, Maya. I will let you get on with your day, but it's been great talking to you and congratulations again on the record. Thank you so much. Um, those are wonderful questions and you clearly listened to the album and it's so nice. And thank you very, very, very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.